because they're Sri Lankan immigrants. They didn't really have help from any government to help them to get him out. When she realized no one was going to help them, she took matters into her own hands. She smuggled herself into Iraq, got a meeting with Saddam Hussein, and negotiated the release of him and 25 other British hostages. <laughs> and it's not known. It's like Argo. It's buried. And so I was like, please, may I? Welcome to the Sonia Barlow Show. My name is Sonia Barlow, and I am the host of this very authentic audio and video based podcast. Ultimately, I wanted to interview ordinary people who are becoming extraordinary all over the world. It's me, my camera and my recorder sharing real life, authentic interviews with people on the ground. I really wanted to create something which doesn't necessarily exist on the internet today. And that's no noise, no clutter, to the point conversations with very cool people all over the world. Most of our content, if not all of it, is directed by you, our listener, our watcher, and our audience member, so thank you. If you have any questions that you want to answer, if you want to be a part of the show, or if you're just interested in where we're traveling next, drop me a line, hello at soniabarlow.co.uk or at soniabarlow.uk. I won't keep you any longer because we have amazing interviews lined up from people all over the world, so let's get straight into the chat. Do you have a sports background? Yes and no. <laughs> I mean, I played when I was younger, for sure. What did you play? I played um, softball, which made me mad because women weren't allowed to play, or girls weren't allowed to play baseball. Okay. And I really prefer the sport of baseball. They're two different sports. Okay. Um, so I was Again, we don't really have any of those in the UK. I know, I know. But, um, you know, like the rules are different for, in tennis for okay. women versus men. Mm-hmm. And the... In baseball, um, it's a smaller ball, and the rules are different. You can steal, you can lead off bases and stuff. And, and for women, it's like they don't think we can run as fast or as far, so they put the bases closer together, and we have a bigger ball, so we can handle it. It's just a different game. Respect to softball players. I just wanted to play baseball. Mm. And I couldn't. Um, but my my brother was an incredible athlete athlete he played every sport and pretty much got scholarships in the u.s which you can do to multiple sports for university so he was extremely athletic so we followed him everywhere (laughs) and the going into sports was that encouraged by your family no no not at all um i was more encouraged to uh get married and have children (laughs) from a young age from a young age, yeah, they didn't even, no one in my family had even gone to university, so okay. I wasn't even expected to do that, and it was a bit of a disappointment, I think, to them when when I decided to go to university. They're like, I grew up in Oklahoma, they're like, Tulsa Junior College is right down the street, why do you have to go off to Nashville? I went to Vanderbilt, and they, okay. they, they had never heard of Vanderbilt, so. And what did you study? I studied um, psychology and human development at Vanderbilt. And then how did you go from studying psychology and human development to starting your own business? Was there like milestones along Uh, the way? It was a long transition. So, um, you know, I I didn't, I I think I still use my degree in just working with people, but um, I didn't go into psychology or anything. I started in PR and advertising and um, went to work there and then ended up in the tech industry out in San Francisco, which was great. I, I loved moving to San Francisco. And then I started my own agency and went through kind of the ups and downs that will happen in volatile markets. Mm. And the 2008 crash kind of like, I was like, I am so tired of this up and down market. I need to expand outside of tech so that I have more stability. And so I'm trying to think of industries that are pretty stable. And besides the merchants of death, which I wasn't willing to do, um, sports seemed mm. like no matter what the economy was doing, people would still buy their tickets to the sports. That's true. Yeah. So I thought I should expand to sports. Um, so I did. I got some sports clients. And what I was doing for them was more on the marketing PR side. It was um, bringing in sponsors and making sure those sponsors got the promotions that they expected and wanted for the dollars that they were spending with the team. So in the process of doing that, I had brought a big tech company in as a sponsor for one of the big um, European football clubs, actually. And um, at the end of the season, (laughs) this big tech company said, so what's our ROI? 
what, we gave you this much money, what did we get out of it? And this club had never been asked that question before. They were like, well, you got to be with us. <laughs> I mean, they would never asked. Absolutely, that. like you, you, got, you got our brand name. Yeah. Like that should be ROI enough. Yeah. Which I'm, I, I'm just gonna uh, interrupt there and just yeah. say, well, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt there, but just say it's really interesting because that concept of where you got to be just a part of our brand name still exists today. Yeah. Right. Because companies are like, oh, who needs to pay expenses? We'll pay you an exposure. Yeah. It's like, no, I'm already exposed. I would like money. Yeah. Yeah. Or data. They wanted data. Um, who interacted with our product? That's what they wanted. Because mm -hmm. data was becoming more and more of a value commodity at that point. Mm -hmm. And um, so they're like, we want data points on who interacted with our product. And we couldn't get it for them. There wasn't really an app to do that. So I think I started out with Well Played Sports with just trying to solve that problem. How mm. can I make my sponsors happy? And can we build into an app offers and promotions and then see who takes that offer and then provide that information within the constructs of GDPR? You know, How can we protect data but also give more valuable information to the sponsors? So it started out that way. I went to a friend of mine in Silicon Valley. I was like, can you help me build this app? <laughs> I mean, this is what I need to do. Yeah. There wasn't really anything that could do that for a small sports team because people think of them as these huge organizations mm -hmm. and they're really a, a small local business with a huge payroll, but they're really small business. So most of the tech that was out there was just too big. They don't have IT people on staff to mm. run a big system. So we started building this data collection tool and it turns out for a sports team, if you're not winning, all your revenue sources suffer. Interesting. Ticket sales, merchandising, yep. TV ad, um, sponsorship dollars, and even in the European club system, transfers and trades. Mm -hmm. So um, all those revenue sources would suffer. So the key was to win. So then they said, can you take that data collection and help it and apply it to performance and see if we can start winning? And that's what, so that's how we went from this long journey from PR to sponsorship dollars in, in sports and then to performance analytics. Gosh, I love that. And we're gonna deep dive so much further. Mm -hmm. But for those who don't know Jane, can you give us a brief introduction to yourself? Oh gosh, I guess I just did, but <laughs> you've heard most of my career now. I was, um, so I, uh, I live in San Francisco and um, I've worked in the tech industry for a long time, mostly on the PR communications marketing side. And um, then I parlayed that into starting this tech company. And on the side, I'm a writer. <laughs> that's very cool. What do you write about? I do. I write screenplays, actually. Interesting. Yeah. So that's why when you type your name into Google, yeah, it comes up as writer. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll get on to that because yeah. I think that's a really cool side hustle. But touching on your tech background, your PR and marketing background, how do you think the industry has changed, evolved, or even become more challenging since you kind of started? You know so long ago yeah. in a way where you were to some extent a pioneer <laughs> of a few of these kind of you know innovative developments be that in sports be that in marketing be that in PR be that in the data analysis and collection mm -hmm. now it seems like everyone's doing a little bit of everything yeah um yeah and I think that's how tech has changed um you know when you hear of now we talk about super apps mm. um that kind of do everything. Like the WeChats of the yeah, world. exactly. And eventually what X might become. Might, we'll see. See if they survive. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's kind of the idea that everybody can do everything, which gets into monopolistic practices, of course. But, um, you know, I don't think there's boundaries and barriers where there, there used to be. People are open to doing and pivoting mm -hmm. to anything, um, which means you have you've always had to be resilient, but now it's like, you got to move super fast. And then AI is going to change everything. It's moving so fast and it's hard to keep up if you don't have the resources um, like the Googles and the Microsofts in the world, which is why they're dominating right now. Absolutely. They have the money, they have the people, they yeah. have the power, but they also the they have the data. And also it's really hard not to use their services. So right now we see individuals who are like, we're gonna boycott Facebook. We're gonna, you know, not use 
Microsoft. But actually, you can't not use Facebook because they own Instagram, they own WhatsApp. Yeah. And so they own a lot of your data. Yeah. Similar to Microsoft, they own LinkedIn. So are you saying that you're never going to use a social app again? Because it's very difficult for yeah. the everyday person. Yeah, I think you have to make your choices because I've certainly decided not to use a lot of social media. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and that was originally because I think Microsoft had a better business model of what they did with data. But now with OpenAI, it's a whole new world. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I'll do. Um, anyway, yeah. <laughs> and how did you... How did you, one, learn about AI and tech when you had no prior experience, but now how do you keep learning about AI and tech as things are evolving? Yeah, it's interesting um, how everything overlaps with AI. Um, so my first encounter with AI was, was in sports, of mm. course. Um, so here we are running data collection things to try and help players perform better and be safer and have less injuries and that sort of thing. Um, and as... As we went along, Google and Microsoft and some of these big companies start coming in and offering to do data analysis for free. Why? Because they want the data. Mm. And we realized where it was going, that it was AI. And there was no way to keep up. And that's kind of when I went, you got to throw in the towel or, or do something different. Um, but that's when I first encountered AI, was the idea of sports, um, AI and sports. Um, and then I had a long string in um, AI and security, and I'm really interested in AI and security because this all, it crosses moral and ethical boundaries that we were just talking about. Like, I could have tried to go in that direction. So if you're gathering data on athletes, that's very valuable information on how they're performing, who they are, and who wants that information? The betting markets. So you could sell that in, and that's your billion dollar market, because you're not gonna make billion dollars selling into teams. They don't have that kind of budget. Um, and that's kind of what I figured out as well. You're not gonna be a unicorn selling into sports teams. They just don't have those kinds of huge budgets and tech needs. Um, the way to make money is to sell into consumers or the betting markets. And um, I really had a moral quandary with giving over these athletes' data. Um, and not really knowing how it would be used now or in the future. I couldn't really control that. So um, AI just became a, a moral quandary for me. Now the way I really got concerned about AI was actually as a writer. I was writing a story, I am writing a story that has a, a middle-aged Sri Lankan lead and um, trying to find images of that, even creating them on AI was impossible. Absolutely. It doesn't exist. So uh, mm -hmm. earlier to this uh, recording, I recorded with Mona Dash, mm -hmm. which will be linked somewhere, hopefully here. Uh, and I spoke about the fact that my name is Sonia Barlow. Mm -hmm. So I went into a, a regenerative tool and I wrote, show me a picture of Sonia Barlow eating cake. Yeah. And the picture that came up was of a white Caucasian woman with like, you know, hair similar to mine, but it was blonde, big eyes, red lips, eating cake. And I was like, big eyes, red lips, cake, they've got right. The rest of it, they don't really have right. Yeah. Which makes no sense to me because there's so many images of me on the internet. Yeah. I'm like, you literally could have plucked any. Because if you go into Google and you type in Sonia Barlow, everything exists. I have a very public profile. Yeah. And so for me, it was like, no, but how are you not even smart enough to use what already exists on the internet? And so what does that mean for me? It means I'm misrepresented. It means that there's a bias when it comes to your name, your image, your ethnicity. Mm -hmm. But also it means now, to some extent, I'm accountable, am I, for what the AI is generating? Does that mean that I, as a consumer, as a user, as an audience member, now have to put more things online so that you can get it right? And that, to me, is also quite troubling. Because it's like, oh, OK, well, we're now psychologically in this environment where we have to create more content for us just to be seen in spaces where we aren't originally kind of either meant to be or we weren't seen before. Yeah, but the quandary is we really don't control that content. Exactly. Which is the, um, so you put more out there, um, and this, this goes to the writer's strike yes. that just ended. You put more content out there and your content can be sucked up into those AI Absolutely. systems and regurgitated as you. Yeah. And you didn't create it. So what's your 
compensation there yeah. for someone using your likeness, your image, your thoughts, your words, your language. Um, and that's also where cloning comes in. Yeah. So I found out last week that I was being cloned on Facebook, <laughs> out of all places in the world. <laughs> So I had all these messages from people being like, oh, we've heard that you're hiring for this PA role, we'd like to apply. And I ignored them because I thought they were spammy. And then like random people, especially on Instagram, so thank you to all the random strangers, honestly, sent me messages being like, hey, Sonia, we've had a message from this person on Facebook. It says your name, they're using your profile, they're using your images, but we went into it and we kind of deep dived and we know it's not you because we follow you on socials, just to FYI. Yeah. And they have literally, and I don't know how they've done it, right? And maybe you, you have more information than I do. One of the images that they've used, I took in 2019. On Facebook, it says that it was taken in 2016. The other image that I used, I literally took a month ago. On Facebook, it says that it was uploaded in 2018. There's no way that that was possible. Yeah. But they finessed their profile in a way where it is. The second point is I then went on Facebook myself and you know my, my family members to report it. Facebook's reply is, we don't see anything wrong with this profile, so we're going to keep it up. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what do you mean? There's so much wrong because I'm the person that it's cloning. And the third point is, is I've spent a lot of time building a morally compliant, value-led, positive profile online. Mm -hmm. Now I've got this fake catfish type scenario that can basically take away that trust that you've built years building. Yeah. But what can you do? Yeah. What can you do when one of the largest companies in the world don't have an email address or a phone number that you can contact? Yeah, yeah, it's not their problem. They don't care. My, my daughter had this similar situation where her profile on Instagram was completely hijacked and it was hacked and taken over. She can't get it back. She lost it. They took over and there's no reporting it. There's no getting it back. But for her, that's no big deal. For you, it's a brand. It's, it's, it's a very big deal. Um, for authors, it's a big deal. For celebrities, it's a big deal. Absolutely. Yeah. And having ownership of your data is a big deal. Mm -hmm. So when you first started your business, how did you go to these football clubs and convince them to, in the nicest way, hand over their data? We put in all kinds of um, layers that I let them check. Um, we anonymized the data. Um, and we had several layers of security because we needed to comply with GDPR and all the... So there, there's privacy protections mm -hmm. in the US which pr basically don't exist. And then there's privacy protections that do exist in Europe. So as long as we were working with European clubs, we had to follow those, yeah. those privacy laws. So we had probably more protections than any US company built into our data and we anonymized it um, and they had access to it at any time. So we were and very transparent. And, and I love that. And that, that I think is the relevant way to go down these tools. I guess before we get into regulation, ethics and moral, I'd love to know how did you fund that? Was it bootstrap, was it investment? Yeah, no, it was, um, it was bootstrapped. It was an investment from me and um, my part partners who built the, the data. Um, and then it was just sales. We, mm. we just lived off of the money we made from selling the product. And that's the way the whole, we never got investment, never, in the whole time. Which Despite is Despite having some pretty big name clubs under our... Which is a brilliant story and use case for your hard work and effort and for your resiliency. Yeah. How do you get back up when someone says, no, we don't want to work with you, or we don't want to give you that chunk of money, or you're at the last moment of signing something across and it gets pulled back, especially when you are a bootstrapped business? Yeah. Most of the time you build for that. It's, it's kind of the nature of the business. No matter what business that you're, you're in, you're going to have people that, that come and go. Um, at some point, you have to decide, when do you throw in the towel? When, when do you call it a day? And... I think there are lots of factors that go into that, but there, people underestimate how, in, how intelligent you have to be on that, on what mm. it is to stop. Like, you could go into debt trying to keep this thing going, and you have to really look, is, this, is there a market? Is Google and Microsoft coming in and giving away stuff for free and I can't keep up with that? They're gonna have more data than me, can I keep up with that? And what's the market really look like? What's the market potential? And um, so I think, you know, as long as you believe the product has potential, you're willing to take more risks, but you always have to be gauging where's this market going and, and make smart decisions about that. I so one of your decisions was to take a step back. Yeah, in 2019, we, 
we were looking at, and, and this is why I call it, it was one of the smartest decisions I ever made, but I didn't know how smart it was at the time. Um, at the time, I was, I, there was no market research data out there mm -hmm. on the sports market. Mm -hmm. um, sports for consumers, like Fitbit, that kind of thing, that data, that market data existed. But what does it mean? What is the the market cap to sell into professional sports teams around the world. So we ended up doing that research and it was very eye-opening. That's when I realized you could not be a unicorn. You could never make a bunch of money. And that's what investors wanted. Absolutely. They want to make a bunch of money. And there isn't, if you're just gonna sell into teams, it's not gonna happen. So then you have to make a decision. Am I gonna sell into retail and other places that need data analytics? And I really loved sports. I didn't want to do retail. So you have to kind of make this decision of, do I want to go down a path that I'm not going to be happy? I'm not going to enjoy it. I really enjoy sports. And it really was the best job I've ever had. I enjoyed it so much. And now I find it impossible to sit in the cheap seats <laughs> at any team, at any event. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I used to sit down there with you. Know, you used to be in the box. Exactly. And now you're in the benches. Yeah. And now you're like, this is not, yeah. this is not what I'm, I was doing. Yeah, so I can't do it. <laughs> I understand. I'm Honestly, I do. It's, a, it's kind of same or similar, but we were talking about Wimbledon. Yeah. And I was really blessed that in 2022, I was invited to Wimbledon, yeah. but I was invited to center court. I was invited to oh, a wow. session prior with Jane Murray. Wow. I was invited to the VIP section. Yeah. I was sitting next to Elle Fanning. Oh gosh. <laughs> and this is also the Wimbledon where they had all the previous stars come along. So I saw Venus and Serena just like from my view, right? Yeah. Because they were there. Oh my gosh, what, what, a, what a game. It was the most amazing thing that I've been on. And I was like, oh, now I understand not only tennis, but why people come to Wimbledon. Like yeah. it was mega epic, yeah. right? Yeah. But with all due respect, I can't go back to Wimbledon if I don't have that experience. Exactly. What is it? I now? can't. I, I, don't, I don't know how. I would be able to. Yeah. So for me, it's like that one-off tick box, most ep one of the most epic experiences of my life. And now I'm like, actually, that's cool that you want to go to Wimbledon and you should. I can give you recommendations. <laughs> I just don't think I can unless go. Unless I'm going with Elle. Exactly, <laughs> unless I'm... I can't. Unless yeah. I am talking to Andy Murray's mom, I don't think that I can do that again. Yes, yes. Unless I'm like in the VIP suite where you have afternoon tea and strawberries and cream. <laughs> coming and serving you. And Taylor Swift is sitting Absol there. <laughs> I mean, I just don't think I can do that again. Yeah. So, so I, I kind of get it. Obviously not to your level, but I kind of get the sentiment. And, and this might sound like a bit snobby to people, and I don't think it is. I think it's more about like hard work gives you results. And then you become accustomed to the results that you've gained, and then you want to strive for more. So now yeah. I'm not sitting here being like, I won't go to Wimbledon again. I'm sitting here being like, what more do I need to do to make sure that I am a repeat visitor and that I'm able to obtain that level of improvement in my lifestyle yeah and, and how do I get there so it actually makes me drive driven and it makes me hustle harder yeah I think that's true, that's true. what is one of the best sports matches that you've been to or that you've seen <sighs> oh my god or memorable maybe memorable is definitely El Clasico with mm. Barcelona and Madrid that was amazing and I it was last minute so if you work in sports or, or, or the World Series but I won't talk about that because Americans love that Europeans don't, but um, El Clasico was amazing. And so if you work in sports, the way it works is um, you have the people who have their season tickets and their seats, and then you have VIP sections for mostly the sponsors and such. So if somebody doesn't show up, you can last minute, if you're working in there, you can last minute get a, a seat that's pretty good. And um, I had this chance to be <laughs> right up on the pitch. <laughs> and, and it was last minute, so I'm calling everybody I know going, can you come to El Clasico with me? <laughs> come to the, the Barcelona Madrid? I'm going to be like right there with Messi. <laughs> no one came. Oh it, my gosh. I went by myself. I wish we were friends back then. <laughs> I think even my production team are like, I wish we were friends back then. That's... I've had plenty of people give me their number and say, if that ever happens again, you call I me. I would drop everything and be there. <laughs> Who, have you had the chance to meet sports stars? Um, yeah, different different ones at different times. I can't say I'm like super close with any of them or like I call up, hey, how you doing? Come to my party. The reason I ask that is because I obviously am quite invested in the tech industry as you mm -hmm. are yourself. And we've seen a big shift from sports stars investing into technology, mm -hmm. building their own tech startups and kind of taking it forward. Yeah. I think that the discipline they have, I think the agility they have, I think the resilience they have make them great leaders in 
that industry. However, I think it's really important to say that they don't have the basic foundational knowledge. And so they're starting from zero as well, yeah. which I think is amazing because you're therefore shifting from one to the right. other. Why is that happening? Do you, have, you, have you seen that happen? And do you have any thoughts on why it might oh, be yeah, happening? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's happening because sports, um, most athletes know they have a short run, that their career is going to end at least by 40, unless you're Tom Brady and then you're pushing it. But um, they've got a finite amount of time on the pitch and they've, they've got to have a career afterwards. So I think they've become much more wise to, I need to invest, mm. I need to create a business, I need to create something with longevity here. Um, and, there, and that's true for not the big names that you see, but the smaller names that you don't necessarily know. They're trying to be more fiscally wise about um, their longevity. So that's why it's happening. Um, and I think it's like how many of us have started business? I started a business in sports. And, and you could say in theory I had no business doing that. Like um, I wasn't an athlete. I just saw a hole in the market and wanted to do it. Um, I think most of tech is that. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to cross every T and dot every I to, to be capable of doing something. Um, meaningful and as long as you're willing to learn and you have the intelligence to step up I think it's great they're like any other founder I know I mean Mark Zuckerberg was in university he had no experience who he, he got somebody entrusted him with millions and millions of dollars and you know if he can do it why not these guys know how to do it yeah I mean of course there's a privilege to some circumstances but I guess what I'm hearing you say is Everyone starts from not knowing what they don't know, but they find a gap and they're willing to put their hustle into solving that problem. Yeah. Myself included. So we've got an app coming out. If LinkedIn and Bumble had a baby, that would be us, the yeah. LMF network. Yeah. But that's after four years of branches, mentorship, talking to people, investigating, documenting, losing money, winning money, having partnerships and sponsors, but also seeing, wait, the problem of loneliness, of friendship, of career conversations, of gender and of confidence still exists despite companies saying they're both investing and they're interested and they're like, you know, morally and ethically pushing it forward, that's still a gap. There are solutions that exist, but they're not really solving the problem. So I'm not doing anything new. Right. I'm just innovating on what already does exist and then putting it all in one place and hoping it works. Yeah. And I think the big part is that you're hoping it works, yeah. right? Because you started a business in sports. And as we started the conversation, you played sports as a child, but it wasn't something that was... You, you know, you weren't as maybe passionate about it as your brother. It wasn't something that led you into colleges or schools. You did psychology. Right. But you had hope in your, in your hustle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I saw a gap. No one, could, no one was filling it. So why not? Why not try to do something with it? And even if it works for a short time and then it doesn't, oh, my gosh, it was the greatest experience. I loved it. No regrets whatsoever. And so earlier you also touched on the regulation and the moral value of AI and, and kind of the, uh, the ethics that come with AI. Can you unpack that slightly for us? Like, do you, I, I, you know, I asked Mona this too, but do you think AI is cheating? In many ways, yes, but also it's not as good as people think it is. Um, so my biggest fear is that it give, we give more credibility to it than it deserves. Mm. Um, we start saying it's always right. And as we just talked about, there's a lot of bias that's built into AI because it's building off what already exists. And what exists is a lot of bias. So when you're using AI for things like job applications, that bias is built in mm -hmm. to the, the, the bots that you have to get through just to get a job. It's screening out for whatever reason. And we don't have a right to question why we were screened out. The bot made the decision and so the decision is final. We can't question that. We can't ask what the well algorithm was that, that eliminated us. And that is a very dangerous place to be because all it is is reinforcing bias. And I think that's more concerning than, oh, AI is gonna take over. It's gonna take over in a way that we can't control it, that we can't question it. And, and I think if there's gonna be regulation, there has to be transparency in how is this algorithm making the decisions that it does? What's the transparency and how can we question it and tweak it? I also am a little bit, at times, maybe uncomfortable disappointed that the individuals that are in the decision-making seats or in the boardrooms or having the conversation around AI, regulation, ethics, 
aren't necessarily the ones who are the end consumers, the audience members, mm -hmm. or the people who are going to purchase um, these, these products. And what I mean by that is I've seen a lot of forums, especially online, where we're doing an AI roundtable here, we're doing a summit here, we're having a get-together here. But the people that are in that room are either not from the background, not building the products, not people of colour, not women, mm -hmm. not the marginalised communities that actually need to be in that room so we can uh, unlock and kind of, you know, kind of, we, we can reduce those biases. Yeah. Because I, I don't think we're ever going to be at a point where there is not a bias. Yeah. We're always going to have biases, but it's yeah. about the reduction and the mitigation of biases. Right. But if we don't have the people in the room that can talk on that point, you know, sometimes I'm here thinking like, what does a government official know about AI? In the nicest way, not because they know so much about other things, right? Like policies and processes and people. But what do they know about AI? And so how are they leading the discussions around AI yeah. with, without having the relevant kind of bootstrap, startup, grassroot companies there as long as like, alongside those kind of big change leaders? Yeah, and it's moving so fast. The regulation that, I mean, you saw the AI summit here. Um, that took place last week and or two weeks ago, whenever it was. Um, by the time they get around to thinking on what regulation might make sense, the, the tech will be so far beyond that it won't make it won't be relevant. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, we talked about social media and some of the ills with social media, and that's because we just let it run unfettered. We still do. We don't check that. And you'd think that we would have learned some lessons about what can go wrong with society, with mental health, with, with human behavior when you don't check these systems. But we didn't learn a thing because we're letting AI run amok as well. And I think that's very frightening. So how do you get your head around it? You're right. You have to have the right mix of people in the room. And you have to have the transparency of the algorithms as well, which gets into um, you know, intellectual property. And the companies aren't going to be willing to do that. But unless you can check it, I don't know how we regulate this. I don't know how a government would. I, would, I don't know how an AI expert would. And the regulation is important because you also touched on the fact you're a screenwriter. Yeah. And so unfortunately what's occurring now is you can have a lot of curated content from the internet, which is someone's IP or someone's article or someone's blog or someone's written you know, content, which is then mesh together to create new content, but ultimately you're reusing old content and so you're, you're copying them or you're not paying them for the rights mm -hmm. or, or ultimately there's also nothing new to exist. Yeah, I mean, AI cannot create something new. It can only regurgitate possibly in a new format what's already been created. So again, it's giving too much cred credibility um, to AI, but I... Um, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, <laughs> I was going to go with that. So earlier you were also talking about the fact that you're writing the screenplay and you have a Sri Lankan um, main lead. Yeah. Before we get on to that particular screenplay, I'd love to know how did you move from data in sports to writing screenplays? Because for <laughs> me, that feels like a little bit of a jump. Yeah, it is. It is. Just a, just a tiny bit. Yeah, it is a huge jump, um, except I've been writing my whole career. Okay. Um, I mean, in PR and communications, you're a writer. And then on the side, I've written stories that have been, it's a side hustle kind of thing, as you said. Um, and after, so I, I ended up um, letting well-played sports go. Um, which was the right thing because it was 2019 and 2020 sports shut down. We wouldn't have made it through 2020. So, um, so in that time when I had a lot of downtime, I was like, what do I really enjoy? I enjoy writing. I just can't make a living doing it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to write. And um, I had all this downtime. Everybody's at home watching Netflix. I'm writing. And um, I just cranked out these screenplays and then... I <laughs> I just enjoyed it. Um, I'm still doing, I'm still in the tech world, as you know, I'm going to Web Summit next week. So I, I feel like I'm in a bit of an identity crisis because I'm in this transition to this career where I've had um, some screenplays optioned, but until they, this year was a mess because of the strikes, the, the writer strike and the, the SAG strike. So, which ended yesterday, hallelujah. Um, so well done, well done to the negotiators Absolutely. on both sides. Absolutely. Um, and on both the writers and the and the actors guild. So I'm hoping that will now allow these things to go into production, and and then hopefully I can 
like do that for a while. But mm. I think I'd get bored doing the same thing over and over again. It's, it's like we talked about earlier when you said what's different about the industry. You can't put like boundaries around what you do. Mm. And I think that's the way life is now. But do you think the fact that you can't put boundaries around things actually then means that people are meshing into other people's territories that aren't theirs or there's no linear route? So a good example being is I started my business in 2020. Mm -hmm. I started a diversity and inclusion consultancy. We then reinvested all our profits into mentoring and career programs. Then in mid-2020, I got a book deal. Yeah. So by 2021, I was an author. Yeah. But I also got a BBC radio show. So yeah. then I was a presenter. Yeah. Come 2022... I was still running a business, I was still authoring, I was still BBC presenting, but because I only had one book, I didn't consider myself an author or writer, yeah. right? I was like, no, you can't be that. If you have one book, you have to do more. And then 2023, I now write for various different magazines and yeah. publications. The point I'm trying to make here is at the end of 2023, I'm getting all these requests being like, oh, you're a journalist. We'd love for you to come and write about here. Yeah. I'm like, but I'm not a journalist. Yeah. Because I don't actually know who I am. Because I can be a journalist, but then I feel silly being like, no, there are people that have actually had a journalist degree. They've gone through the journalist training. They actually do journalism as a day-to-day -day job. Like, who am I to take their title just because I now write and because I interview people? Does that make me qualified to be a journalist? Do I, am I blurring some boundaries? Am I, like, aggravating people by saying that? Or am I in a position where I'm rightfully able to claim that identity? And... It's it's a it's a little bit it's a little bit confusing right now. Yeah, I suppose it is, but I still think that journalism is one thing, but then thought leadership and um, being a contributor is another thing. Mm. You're not trying to be a journalist; you're being a contributor, and that's totally valid because you have something to contribute. You're not presenting yourself as an investigative reporter. That, that's a very specific skill set. So as long as you're not doing that, then you're fine. Um, and, and I always look at like Ryan Reynolds. How many careers does he have going at the same time? I mean, he runs a sports team. He runs a, a mobile company. He's an actor. I mean, I don't see many men putting boxes around what they can and can't do. And so I'm really not interested in that either. And so why do you therefore think that you're having a bit of an identity crisis? Um, because I really write, I really love writing. I really love it. I'd rather just be doing that, but I have to pay the bills. <laughs> yeah, write, writing doesn't make people rich. No. I don't know why there's like, a, you know, that's a myth that we could debunk. Like no one's, not no one, that's yeah. a big statement. Yeah. Some people are really rich of writing. Most the minority. Not. Yeah. My, I have a good friend, one of my best friends is the New York Times bestseller. Okay. She's still a lawyer on the side. I mean, that's her main hustle. Her main job is, is she's still a lawyer. And she's had like four books out mm. and, um, you know, global bestsellers. There's no money in no. writing. So, um, but and it's interesting. It's fun. And that's the thing. It's interesting because I follow Emma Gannon online and she talks a lot about the fact that writers don't actually make a lot of money when they go down the publishing route or the mm -hmm. traditional publishing route. And so we see a lot of writers now go onto Substack mm -hmm. and charge for there's newsletters because yeah. they're like look we've got the skill we've got the commitment we know what we're talking about here's the resources but why should we give content out for free yeah but then also I feel conflicted and again it's a moral ethic code it's like oh but if I've learned all of this I want you to know it because I want to help you yeah. and now recently you know people are like look you you can't keep giving things out for free like you need to put a price point on it and if they're not comfortable with your price point then they're not your customer yeah so if someone will pay because you haven't worked hard for five to ten years only for you to give so much free content out. Yeah. But at the same time, when you produce more content and you're pushing out more content, you get more opportunities that can be paid campaigns. Yeah. But going on to your point about data and analytics, the problem is that companies aren't really checking your engagement. They're just checking your follow account. So it's just, yeah. you know, clout metrics. And yeah. there's no real way to navigate that space. Yeah, it's true. And I mean, I think it depends on what your business goal is, what your long-term goal is. If you're giving away content for free because you have a different end than being a writer and making money off writing, that's okay. Um, if you really want to be a writer, you need to rethink that and how you value your output. Um, but you can have different business models that are just promotion, like <laughs> going back to the sports model. Um, SAP is too big of a system for a sports team. That is a huge enterprise global system, and mm -hmm. these are, again, small teams. But they give it to free, away for free to 
these sports teams because it gives them so much publicity. So that is a strategy. Absolutely. It just depends on what your business model is. And so when you are writing, so again, going to the character who is a Sri Lankan man in your mm -hmm. next screenplay, how do you... How do you create the kind of concept of what you're going to write about? How do you get into the zone? How do you really understand these characters when you don't maybe have the lived experience? Um, yeah, actually, um, I like true stories about unsung heroes. Cool. Who have done extraordinary things and not been recognized for it and been kind of ignored by history. So this story is actually about my good friends who are here from England and their, their parents. And um, I was having dinner with them one night, and the dad said to me, did I ever tell you about the time I was kidnapped by Saddam Hussein? Uh, no. <laughs> I would have remembered tell that. Tell us all, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he was in... Um, Can I just pause there and just say what a weird thing, not weird, but what a weird and wonderful thing for someone to say at dinner. Like, did I ever, yeah. did I ever tell you about that like time so that casual. I was kidnapped? Yeah. Whilst you, like finish a roast dinner or something. Right, well, I'm having this Sri Lankan, you know, feast. And uh, uh, I was like, absolutely not. You know, and I've known them for so long and it never came up. So he was in Kuwait City on, in 1990, layover for a few hours, wrong place, wrong time in Kuwait City. And Iraq invades Kuwait and he gets taken as a hostage and moved to Iraq. But the best part is because they're Sri Lankan immigrants, they're kind of, they didn't really have help from any government to help them get this, to get him out. So I, I love the fact you're like, the best part is that no, they did, weren't no, able to get because help. Because his, his wife, when she realized no one was gonna help them, she took matters into her own hands. She smuggled herself into Iraq, got a meeting with Saddam Hussein, and negotiated the release of him and 25 other British hostages. <laughs> and it's not known, it's like Argo, it's buried. And so I was like, please, may I have the rights to this story? Luckily, their son, my friend, is... is I love like, that. You know, there's the book Never Split the Difference mm -hmm. about the negotiation tactic. It's like quite well known. And that's what people reference because I think the, the person who wrote it used to do negotiation for like these kind of things. Uh -huh. I feel like that the wife really needs to give her top tips on how to negotiate, <laughs> not just hostage situation, but salaries, <laughs> <laughs> careers, <laughs> investment, good opportunities. And anyone who comes to you saying, exposure is what you need and not, I'm not going to pay your expenses. Like, what great tips. So you then asked them if you could have the rights. Yeah, you then went away the and kind of I, mind no, mapped. No, I didn't go away. I went to their house and lived with them and, uh, for a while and... and heard the stories, I interviewed them, I went and did BBC archives, mm -hmm. and because you couldn't search this on the internet, it's so buried, and it was 1990, yes. the internet didn't exist, mm -hmm. so, um, so I had to do a lot of research and spend a lot of time with them and get the story as right as I could. Amazing. Um, from their point of view. And, and then the what do you do? So once you've got a story that you think is like sellable and it's a great story, yeah. do you then outreach to people like agents or publicists yeah, that might I think buy you it? Do anything and everything that you can to get the story out. I started entering competitions um, with the screenplay just to get feedback. Um, and I uh, eventually got on this thing called The Blacklist in, in Hollywood, which was a list of you know top screenplays. And um, from there I, I had producers start calling me to produce the movie, but it is a long freaking haul. It's not like anything happens So overnight. one day, hopefully, we're gonna see your movie in lights. I hope so. In I like uh, Leicester Square or like Piccadilly Circus. I we're gonna see so. your... I hope it's gonna be a, a, a TV show here that's produced here in the UK. It's, it's a very UK cool. story, so I'm hoping it'll, it'll go here. And, and so what are some of the skills that you've been able to transfer from your sports and data world into your screenwriting world? Oh, it's almost the same. I had no connections in the sports world and I had to make them. I had to go out, go to the conferences, meet people and, and, and make connections because that's how you get anything done. It's your network. And um, I realized I had this great network in tech, but I don't in Hollywood. So I just had to beat the pavement and call everybody and like show up and ask anybody to have lunch with me. And um, that's, that's how I've done it. Just network, network, get, get out there and talk to people. And then what do you do? So a good example being, I want my own talk show. This is why I'm doing this, to uh -huh. prove, to provide evidence. Mm -hmm. Because no one's just going to come wake up one day and be like, oh, Sonia wants it, we're going to give it to her. Yeah. I, as a woman, unfortunately, have to earn my stripes. <laughs> and I will make sure I do and go above and beyond. Yeah. So I've networked with people. I've gone out and spoken to them. I've had lunch with them. 
And then what do you do? Do you follow up with a sales pitch? Do you follow up with a warm lead? Do you follow up with a, here's an episode, would you like to come on? Like, what is the process, especially for people who want to create opportunities through networking, but don't really know how to do the follow-up part? Yeah, um, I have found that, yes, you stay in touch, you keep following up. Um, one lead de leads to another lead, um, but you say what you want. You say it outright, I mean, like you just did. I want a talk show of my own. You tell them, because they can't help you if they don't know what you want. So say it, ask for it, and see who can, and keep asking until mm -hmm. somebody can, can help you. And, and um, that's, that's what I did. I just kept asking, and I'm still doing. Like, I'm, I'm here this week, <laughs> still doing the same thing, meeting with producers, meeting with directors and actors. And, and the like, interesting here thing, the interesting thing is, at the beginning you mentioned you don't have too much social media. Yeah. How do you navigate the relationships, uh, find the connections, you know, have dinners with them when you're not online? Because a lot of people now don't want to be online. A lot of people don't want to be using social apps, but they feel like if they're not online, they're going to be missing opportunities. So you have a level of FOMO. Well, it's funny because everybody's online. So if you want to stand out, do something different. Mm. So because I'm not coming at them on DMs, I stand out. I, I, I think that makes me unique and different. So I'm taking an old fashioned thing of I'll, I'll email you, I'll call you. Um, yeah, I, I've used other methods, but um, I know people have said, you know, the best way to get to this agent or this director is online. I'm like, why? They're, everybody's online. Everybody's coming after them that way. I, I do not find it useful at all. And so I found it to be much more refreshing to try the old fashioned way. <laughs> and you mentioned earlier that you yourself have a daughter. Yeah. A lot of the content that we produce, a lot of these discussions, a majority of our listeners are, are women, mm -hmm. um, regardless of their age, but they identify as women or non-binary folk. They are stuck a little bit confused. They're ambitious. They want to kind of lean on their confidence and they want to get to the next step. Mm -hmm. What would your career advice be for them? Oh my gosh. This this next generation that's coming up, I feel like I have no advice for them. They're killing it. They're, they're amazing. If anything, we're learning from them. Exactly, exactly. I wish I had, I had been them and their generation. Just <laughs> knock it all down. I mean, they are no BS. They do not take it. And um, they know who they are. They know what they want. I think it's, uh, if I had any advice to them, it's please just go change the world. Just go do it. I, I see they all have these great ideas. Um, I see them get held back. 2020 really did a number on a lot of people, but especially that Absolutely. generation. It was really hard on them. So I think this transition of going back to meeting in person and talking to people, they're going to have to figure out how to navigate that. But I'm not going to tell them how because they're going to figure it out. <laughs> the one thing I would say, though, is you touched on resiliency, be that as a sports star, be that working in tech and sports, be that screenwriting, be that knocking on doors. One thing I do find with young professionals, and this is a question we get all the time, is we're, a, we're afraid of failing. We're afraid, we're, we fear the rejection. Everyone online looks so successful. And so if that's not the concept that we have or we don't have that in a day, we don't know if we're good enough to carry on. If we were to focus on that narrative, like they're out to change the world and there are no BS type of uh, generation, but they're also a little bit scared of failure mm -hmm. and rejection and, uh, n you know, getting a no, basically. Yeah. How do, you, how do you kind of overcome that failure and how do you keep going? You know, fail. That's how you overcome it. Fail. Do something that you totally mess up on and it is the best thing that could happen to you. Um, I used to do this show in, in the US. It's kind of like BBC Radio. It's NPR. Mm -hmm. um, NPR has a show called um, The Moth Storytelling Hour. So I was a storyteller. And I finally had won enough storytelling competitions that I was like, in this grand slam on stage in front of thousands of people. And I was terrified, just terrified. I thought I was gonna pass out on stage. And I got up there and I bombed. I completely lost and messed it up. And after that, I was like, well, what do I have to fear now? The worst that could happen has already happened. And there's some kind of like letting go in that. Mm. You're like, okay, if the worst thing has already happened, why be afraid now? Let's just get on with it. And so the next time I won. But it, it took that failure to really get me to let go and stop worrying about it. Um, mm -hmm. I think failure is a gift. And it, when, I, when I was 
in my job, when I'm interviewing people, I ask them when they failed big. And, and if they haven't, I'm less reticent to hire them because A, they're not a risk taker, and B, they haven't figured out how to climb back from that. And it is the most important skill that you can have. And I feel like that generation actually was kind of like the helicopter parent generation where there was just no room for failure at all. You couldn't get a bad grade. You, you, it just, we did not set them up well. Mm. And so I, I see why the anxiety is there, but just do it, jump off, do it. It's, it's the greatest thing that will ever happen to you is to fail. Well, Jane, I think that's a really solid note to wrap this interview on. So far, I've learned, even if you don't know what you don't know, find the problem, bring your customers along for the light, and just keep on going. Failure is key. Build your resilience. If you want something, honestly, go and knock down doors. And just because you might not have a big social presence or a big personal brand or be a multi-influencer, that's okay because you're unique in your own subset and really focus on that. And when it comes to the future of tech, you know, future of innovation and AI, ultimately, we have a part to play in making sure that what is being produced is relative and relevant to the end consumer. And a lot of that, again, is just about speaking up, showing up and correcting what already is to exist, be that through platforms, be that talking to people, um, or be that just challenging the social content that does exist. Jane, how can people connect with you given that you are not on social media? <laughs> I am on LinkedIn. You can connect me with, uh, with me on LinkedIn at Jane Gideon. Easy to find me there. And, um, otherwise, you know, I don't know, run into me at Web Summit or someplace like that. Otherwise, so all the person, links will be at the, the bottom. Time. And when Jane is a big time screenwriter and producer, we will, we will obviously tag her everywhere. So I'm, looking, <laughs> I'm actually personally looking forward to this story. So I'm hoping that it gets picked up and it gets put out because I too. think you've also done a great sales pitch. Uh, thank you. That's just, that's just how you start. Like, I was kidnapped by Saddam Hussein. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. It was real fun. <laughs>